Welcome to What Matters Water TV and Podcast, a new forum that looks to address emerging issues and personalities tackling California's water challenges. My name is Charlie Wilson, and I'm privileged to serve as Executive Director and CEO of the Southern California Water Coalition and your host for this series. Today, we're talking to two California legislators who are fighting climate change impacts by pushing for laws and policies about water and energy that will affect Californians for years to come. We'll discuss how they hope to empower everyday people like you and me to make significant changes in how we use natural resources while still protecting the environment. There's a lot of work to be done and Senator Henry Stern and Assembly Member Eduardo Garcia are working to make sure we don't squander our efforts to make a real and lasting difference for California water. Senator Henry Stern is a sixth generation Californian, which makes him a surfer a new dad and the representative of the 27th district encompassing parts of Los Angeles and Ventura counties. Prior to being elected in November of 2016, he was an environmental attorney and a senior advisor to his predecessor, Senator Fran Pavley. As someone who's experienced firsthand the wildfire devastation, Stern worked to boost the state's wildfire preparedness and he pushed hard to address what he calls the state's climate emergency. Assembly member Eduardo Garcia, a son of Coachella Valley, a proud father and a passionate advocate for addressing the environmental issues of the Salton Sea, he represents the 56th district covering Eastern Riverside and Imperial counties. He is acknowledged as a driving force behind California's historic climate change package, a groundbreaking legislative effort that will help steer our state into a more sustainable future. So get ready to be inspired, and informed as we talk about these two legislators, how they got here, what they're fighting for, and why Californians should care. Stay with us for What Matters. I am so privileged to welcome formally Senator Henry Stern. And Henry, um, I got to ask, you know, just coming out of the shoot here, you are a sixth generation Californian. Very few people can talk about being a native of Los Angeles and California. But when we last talked, you had added the seventh generation to California. And I got to ask, as the new dad, how's the family? How, how, how are things uh, now that you're acclimating with, with kids? Uh, I've been humbled instantly. Uh, Ava is uh, just finished her four-month checkup today. She's, uh, she's over in the other room. We're, we're legislating and caretaking all at the same time in this house. We actually got a few generations in the household, but we look after my father-in-law, who's a 93-year-old uh, veteran survivor of Holocaust and, you know, more things than you can ever imagine, but then all the way down to, you know, this little four-month-old. So I got a full plate at home, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I, people like me, you know, especially when you're in politics, it's a very good thing to have somebody look at you skeptically, even though they just arrived on this planet and not, uh, not just boost your ego. She's like, what are you, what are you doing for me lately? You know? So it's been good. So Thanks. it's nice then when those calls come and all those demands on you as a legislator and as a leader, and you have both your, your wife and, and the baby, it's like, yeah, does this really matter? <laughs> yeah. where, where the heck are you going now, buddy? Totally. totally. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we need, I, I need that every day. I, I, I feel, uh, you know, this work, especially in like infrastructure and water and stuff we're going to be talking about, gets pretty ethereal sometimes. So you need somebody to pull you back down to earth. So I've been I've been pulled. Well, I appreciate it. And we, we did talk, you know, let's, you know, sleep is, is grossly overrated. So we're <laughs> glad that you're, you're highly caffeinated, you're active. But but to that, um, you have served as the chair and you're currently the chair of the Senate, Senate Natural Resource and Water Committee. You've been doing that now. You're, you know, sort of four years into it. You're kind of the seasoned veteran. Um, I know that you're, you know, just based on your background as an environmental attorney and the work you did with Fran Pavley, with Henry Waxman, you seem to have really focused uh, your legislative or leadership agenda, if you will, around this issue of natural resources, water, energy. Uh, how did you end up sort of becoming so focused, if you will, around the environment and around issues uh, that, that contribute to the environment? Well, I, I got good advice early on in my career um, to, you know, not not necessarily swing at every pitch, right? To to find out what you're good at and do it really well. 
Um, and I learned early on in my career, you know, my dad's an actor and my mom's a chef or was a, you know, she was a cook, really a line cook growing up, but she graduated up through the ranks. So dropped out of culinary school some, you know, some time before going to law school where she told me, don't go be a cook. And uh, it's a terrible job. You may love food, but don't. And my dad uh, uh, didn't give me the part. I tried out for a movie of his when I was 10 years old. And he said, you're a terrible actor. Go find another line of work. So, you know, I knew I wanted to help people. I've always known I wanted to serve and, uh, and found, you know, when I was at, when I was at Cal really um, doing my law degree, I got, you know, it was a special time in the country. It was before Obama had come in. And there were a lot of smart people there up at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and in my class, but at the engineering school and at the business school. And so, and as a good lawyer, you just go find really good people to work for. So I don't know when I, the, having your client be uh, the people of California, um, not just for now, but for generations to come feels like a, a project worth putting my whole life into. Well, you, I mean, even if I go beyond that, I mean, you were also, I mean, out of that natural resource and water stuff, you, you have, you're not chairing the Joint Legislative Committee on Emergency Management. And I guess just over the last four years alone, between fires and droughts and floods, and it's like we're in this constant state of emergency management. That that could be like full-time job alone. Well, I will say, so I spent many years studying climate change, working in a legal capacity politically getting involved policy-wise. And then I just, I've just experienced it. I've lived it, right? And I think that's what everyone's gonna start living now is like, what was your, what's been your disaster that you've dealt with? And everyone's gonna get touched. I mean, we grew up with droughts, right? But this is droughts on steroids. This is a permanent drought. Wildfire burned my apartment down. I still don't have the, still gotta like go find a bike. I gotta, you know, I, they end up, you know, I got a FEMA, I was a FEMA check recipient. I tried to send it back, but they're like, this is what happens when you're a victim of a fire. So I think going through that power outages and 120 degree heat days, and it just, it gets very real and it stops being politics or law and it starts just being people. And that, I think that's, that's the mission I'm on is really trying to make what otherwise is invisible, um, very real for people before it becomes all too visible because no one notices this work until the water's not there or until your power's off right like nobody cares as long as it's working but um that's my job is to try to explain you know that comes from somewhere well so let me dig in a little bit on that then so because then we talk in the world of both water and energy you know the new phraseology it's resiliency and the definition of resiliency so that no matter what happens we have the ability to serve, we have the ability with the backups, the systems, the management, everything is in place. What does resiliency mean to you? And how do you best sort of at that 30,000 foot level, how do you, how do you prescri- prescribe to, that we achieve resiliency as a state with these very complex systems? Resiliency to me means no surprises, uh, no unknown unknowns. Um, to quote a former secretary of defense, uh, uh, you know, the, we know what's coming. It's not as if, um, you know, there's some, there's, there's degrees of, of variability in the, in the crises and disasters we're going to be facing, but we know it's getting hotter. We know it's getting more arid. I call it the great drying because it's not a drought. It's the entire aridification of the West. I mean, we are going to see this stuff coming and all the social dislocation that comes with it. Refugee crises, um, mass resource conflicts. I mean, I don't think this is too pie in the sky. I really do think we're gonna destabilize ourselves over the next 15, 20 years here if we don't get ahead of it. So to me, resiliency is thinking ahead. It's, uh, you know, it's not procrastinating in policymaking and it's, it's about a durability that is actually tangible to people um, when bad things happen. So let me go a step further because that's this where kind of we live, eat and breathe. It's one thing as a legislator to set that policy objective. And you know we've got the governor's resiliency water portfolio. I know that at the, the legislative level, you got to be 100 on the energy and the, the greenhouse gas impacts. But then you've got all of that 
you know, the regulatory agencies and that flow down to put then the physical facilities in place for op you know, true operation, whether it's, you know, as we talk today, yeah, we're in a drought period, but we're building and investing in the next dry cycle. And that takes 10, 15 years, same in energy, right? You can't get rid of, you know, coastal natural gas power plants until <laughs> You've got the transmission in place to replace it and actually to get, you know, whether it's water or energy, get things to load. Yes. Is it frustrating to set the policy objective? And, you know, what what tools do you have in your bag to sort of, you know, brand or push or poke, prod somebody's like, hey, we need it now. I yes. can't wait 15 years. I got to go now to be ready in 15 years. I specialize in frustration. Um, it's like when your alarm clock goes off in the morning, um, if you're the kind of person who hits snooze and lets it go off, or if you get right out of bed, I think we're neither. I think we're just, it's just keeps beeping, right? And that, that buzzing constantly going and waking up in a daily state of urgency and emergency, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's been really, it's been really hard uh, to, to go through this and kind of, you know, we go through these cycles where everyone's focused on water and then it rains and we're, yeah, like, we're done. Yeah. We're all done. It's over. Yay. Thank God. And we'll just, you know, we'll just pray for it. And it's not, it, this, this can't be a faith-based exercise. This is a planning exercise. And so, you know, it's all about finding coalitions of the willing here to get ahead of this and, you know, it's on us if we don't solve this now, because this year in particular, this year in particular, with the with the surplus we've got in the budget and the urgency we see from a science perspective and the crush that's happening at the retail level, uh, if, if we don't make big uh, game changing investments now, um, I think we're going to, you know, Ava's going to be really pissed off at her dad in about a decade. <laughs> Well, it's like you're serving as the best straight man because I, you know, that's exactly right. We we're seeing unprecedented amounts of funding available, whether it's at the federal level, at the state level. In fact, the Fed's just pushing it over to the state for implementation. And as an example, you know, we we did what like five billion dollars in water resiliency funding over three years, um, beginning in 2021. Yeah. And there was that you know immediate conclusion: Hey, we're we're covered, we're done. But are we really? It, does, it seems like those become almost happy dollars and we haven't really made significant investment in the type of say big project or yes. multi-benefit project that somebody can hold on to and say, you know what, this is going to do X by date certain, therefore I can let go of these other old ways of doing things. Kind of like I referenced, you know, you know, coastal power plants until one decision is clearly made and you have the other prepared to go. Are we are we just sort of kidding ourselves and kind of stringing ourselves along? There's a danger in that. I mean, I, the, you know, when you say a number like five billion, and I think it was five point two billion, not to be too specific, but I, I I got deep into these budget negotiations last year and was very vocal through the process about a um, a delusion about scale and what it's really going to take. Because when you say a number like five point two billion, you think, wow, that's a lot. Or you know, in the past, we've done these water bonds even where. I frankly think, all due respect to former Governor Brown and his his uh, you know asceticism, because that got us through a debt crisis. But too small, too small. And every time we've sort of undershot it and looked at the art of the possible, but not at the art of the necessary. And I think, you know, even if we even if we doubled that this year statewide, it still wouldn't be enough. Because I mean. It, unless you're going to finance this on all the ratepayers and all the mm -hmm. people hurting out there, you're, you're going to be in a really tough spot. And that's the problem is the burdens are eventually going to fall on the customers and on the agencies. So as a state, look, if we said we got $5 billion to go to water recycling in the Los Angeles region or region or the metropolitan region, mm -hmm. then, then I think we're talking, right. right. Then, then, then you're, then you're looking at scale. Um, but the, it, that money goes away quick. A two hundred million dollar water recycling pot for the entire state of California, <laughs> right? I mean, yes. that'll be gone in a blink of an eye. And right. so when we, you know, when we are dismayed at seeing Hyperion break down on us, or you know, everyone's saying, "Well, why can't Carson go faster and get this joint project going?" Um, we're undershooting it, and I think that it's. I'm not a you know 
press releases are, are good and announcements are good, but when you actually match the supply to the demand right now, I think yeah. we're still awfully short. Well, it also strikes me, you know, we get the difference between we're talking about drought relief and people are hurting temporarily through, again, through a dry cycle. But as you say, it's that, you know, that drought preparation project It's the next cycle. What are we doing in that water recycling? What are we doing in potable reuse? What are we doing in stormwater management and, you know, desalination? What are the hard projects that sometimes people don't really want to talk about? But that's real quote, in infrastructure investment, right? That's really kind of what we get to. It's infrastructure investment. It's also building long-term consumer signals too. It's not, I mean, look, the turf replacement program that we had back in 16, big success, got a lot turned over, a lot of good, you know, drought resistant lawns now, but still uh, that was a one-time, one-shot, like it's a, it's a, we got a fire sale, come on down, as opposed to a sustained market signal that lasts over the next decade where where you know businesses and consumers are going to know that there's going to be this rebate program or this performance incentive for the long term and you know some of that gets back to bigger structural issues too about you know things like prop 218 and rate structures yeah. and sort of the bind that we find ourselves in in water that we can't always be as creative as we are say in energy where we've been yeah. able to to de decouple use from rates, you know, we're stuck in a different paradigm. Everyone, everyone brings up Israel too, for example, right? There's a, why can't we be more like Israel? Well, it's not even a property right in Israel, right? So start there, you know, we're in the great American West here. And so we're built on a foundation of plenty with, with scarcity. So we've, right. we're, we're, we're coming at it backwards in a way, and we've got to rearrange a lot of that. All right. Well, let me dig just a little bit deeper. I love to keep going down that well, like I'm a you know Central Valley farmer, kind of drilling for that next <laughs> of the water. It's like, so storage becomes one of those really massive components to that puzzle. Southern California, we talk frequently, and most of our storage is underground. We have nice, robust, big underground storage, very little surface storage, juxtaposed to say the folks in the northern end of the state where they they see the surface lakes and storage. But holistically, you know, as we see it, you got to be able to move it when it's available. This last wet cycle, I think, is probably a really good example. We got a whole lot of precipitation. Yes, we're really fortunate that we got the traditional snowpack in the Sierras that will drain off in its usual pattern. But we also got a lot of heavier rain and we'll get heavier rain with those, you know, the jet stream. We simply don't have the ability to capture and store that yet. How, how, where do you see storage and conveyance and that linkage and its importance to Southern California and what we can do within the basin, how we do that in the basin? I mean, every time we get one of these rains, I remember I was starting to really make the rounds with the people I work for, the million people in you know North LA and Tura County talking about the drought and then the rains came and uh, they said, it's done. And I, I have to remind people that over 90% of that water is right out to the Pacific Ocean, right? So the, you're, when, you, when you add up the math on the precipitation that came through, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars wasted, literally wasted just down the drain. I mean, out that LA river and sweeping people and all kinds of other stuff with it. It's, uh, we have to be very opportunistic if we're going to think about uh, how to sustain ourselves in this greater Southern California uh, demand pocket, because it's not, yeah, it's storage here is, is about small pockets of opportunistic um, resources. Um, and then the sort of, to me, the mega, the mega project of storage down South is, is our groundwater aquifer cleanup right. effort that, as you said, if speed's the name of the game, the geology isn't our friend in that way, right? I mean, I, I, I came into office thinking, why, why can't this be done? Why can't groundwater be, cleanup be done, you know, right. two years? Let's, and you think, well, how do you push water through rock in two years, right? It doesn't, like Moses did it, uh, but that was a different, he had like a special staff there that was, you know, had a little different power behind did, did you Did you not assume that staff when you took office? You know, they didn't have that in the I asked Pavley where it was, and um, anyway, it's. I think it's back in the book of uh, Deuteronomy somewhere. But um, 
Yeah, it's there's no magic to this, and there's no the 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 aquifers that we've polluted in LA through our sort of misuse of all kinds of different chemicals. It it still is not fixed. Now, if we had those fixed up and cleaned up, it'd be a whole different system. But I think you know while we're doing that long term project, the speedy projects that we're looking at, things like what Las Virginis is doing, that pure water project, and doing some of that reuse and finding those pockets, looking at places, you know, it's about the Castaics, it's about Casitas, it's about the, the little pockets here and there. And uh, it may even get to be distributed. I mean, it may be even about gray water systems and getting infrastructure decentralized in storage in a way that I don't think we've really given a go yet. No, well, there's another one of those similarities with energy, right? As we've completely transformed energy over the last 15 years or so, I really see actually the water sector, there's a lot of lessons to be learned there about how you fundamentally restructure, how you transmit, how you distribute, uh, and then how you reallocate those resources. And that's really different where you're now literally like energy, you're pushing from the ocean kind of back uphill. That's right. And and being able to use it in that distributed sort of way. We, we haven't really thought about that. Well, and empowering people to do something about it. I mean, it's one thing to say, just brush your teeth for 30 seconds or take a short shower. And look, people do pitch in you know, a lot when that happens. But I think I, I, was fi- I get frustrated with those mantras uh, when it comes to climate change in general. Like if you would just use a little bit less toilet paper and not do this and that, like we haven't give consumers enough power in the water game to really see the incentive for changing their behavior. And I think, you know, that that's going to take uh, a decentralized approach that big becomes small. And uh, that that's not something we're there yet with. Um, but I think that, you know, the gray water work going on at some of the city levels, I think some of the municipal code and statewide building code work going on around backflow and all the sort of piping retrofits. I'm hoping with, as we address the housing shortage, especially that we put in place the kind of housing and the kind of infrastructure that uh, won't just take, you know, one big tunnel to, to feed it. It's got to find a way to, to do more with less. Like, so, so give me your crystal ball, this legislative session, you, you know, you've expressed some interest in doing some other things at the local level, the County of LA, but yeah. yet you still got work to do uh, as a new dad and, and, and as a state legislator, but where, where do you see uh, the governor's attention? Where do you see your colleagues attention and, and you as a committee chair, and then the role you play as you indicated in finance on budget? I mean, you have really a heavy say in a whole lot of this legislative system and what comes out at the end of the year. Where do you see the real action uh, for the 2022 and into the 2023 uh, legislative cycle? Well, I think, you know, we, we've done some good policy making in the past, making conservation a way of life and dealing with Sigma and, you know, putting some decent policy architecture in place around urban water management planning or the integrated resource planning that we've been doing. But I think we're going to, you know, we're going to have to put in place policy that empowers localities, agencies, and consumers with, I think, long range incentives while we're doing sort of short term, massive capital outlays. And to me, that's, that's, the, that's the magic puzzle is can we start to put the signals in place that'll last a decade and build a new marketplace, say, for, for drought resistant landscaping that can last beyond just a one shot stimulus that actually is, yeah. is built in. But at the same time, you know, times of plenty, right? We have to capital infrastructure build outs of all kinds, right? I mean, in a really diverse range, that's going to be, well, you know, water's, uh, what do they say? Whiskey for drinking and water for fighting. So, um, you know, there'll be no doubt a lot of squabbling over where those resources go. Um, and I think the only big risk for us this year is that, um, we squander the opportunity to collectively act because everyone's sort of looking after their own backyard, you know, this particular right. project or that. I, so, you know, I see my, my job in this committee um, as, you know, trying to put coalitions together statewide to do this work. And, uh, you know, as for the local, my local ambitions, it's all a function of that same frustration I uh, mentioned at the outset where I, I live there because I think you may say I have a heavy voice in this work, 
But I would say, you know, as a legislator, you have to chirp as an advocate often, right? You have to be noticed. I don't actually control the gears of the budget or the administration thereof, right? And I think that's, you know, that's part of why I at least one way or another, either through the state or at a local level, we're going to try to keep getting our hands on the gears here and actually see projects through because yeah. look, we'll run some bills. Um, we'll be part of some, you know, exciting announcements, but I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't care about that part of the job. Like I, I actually, I really, I really envy my water manager colleagues jobs in some ways, you know, I, I look at what Adele does and I look at what Peterson does and I look at, you know, what are, what are, what are, well-placed engineers and planners are doing to me is everything. And if they can get the political support they need to sort of have space to go, um, we're going to be good. But, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, what do they say? Democracy. It's the worst form of government, except for all the other, all all the others. So (laughs) let's be better than that. Well, and I think, you know, again, we've sort of looked at uh, holistically uh, this issue about Southern California, right? We're, we're that most arid piece of the state, and, and we're looking real hard at uh, exactly what you described. How do we coalesce regionally around sort of the big ticket priorities and not be caught in that I'm struggling fighting over where, you know, the big dogs in L.A. are competing in Orange County and San Diego? It's like, no, no, it's a region, and we all, you know, we either grow or, or, or fail together. So how do we help coalesce around that? So we're, we're looking forward to actually working with you on that. Yeah, well, one water, it truly is. And when you're serving, when you're talking about a coalition serving over 60% of the state, and yet we got to go in there and scrap for, mm, you know, maybe one twentieth of the budget last year, that timing of that drought declaration really hurt us because they said, this is a Northern issue, this is a Northern issue. So we were sort of like, it's always a Southern issue. It happens to be a Northern issue right now, but we live in drought. Um, We as at a political level, have to do that coalition building throughout the Southland. And uh, if we get there and we're loud enough, um, we'll, we'll win at this thing. I just, um, it's, it's, it doesn't need to be a zero sum game right now. Mm -hmm. The way I think about it is if, if we, if we truly are one water, which that's, I mean, nature tells us so, but our politics don't sometimes, but that, that shared ecology, we're going to take pressure off the central Valley farmers if we can do more in Southern California and the North isn't going to have to worry as much about their water um, coming to us when we don't need as much. So when we think about the puzzle that way, even the Colorado river politics throughout the West, right? The more we can invest in sustainable local infrastructure and that water security, uh, it's, it's going to only help the politics. Well, Senator Stern, I got to say, thank you very much for your leadership. I want to say thank you for your, Frankly, if nothing else, just your energy in bringing that focus to natural resource issues in Sacramento. Yeah, you're right. It's that sort of chirping. Sometimes, you know, as you saw, our our award each year to real outstanding influencers in this space is a two by four. Sometimes you just kind of need to (laughs) use use a big, heavy stick, you know, uh, to get people's attention. But on behalf of Southern California, I want to say thanks, but for your leadership statewide, because I think you're one of those that really recognizes it's a statewide issue. We're either in this together or we're not. We're sort of just fighting amongst ourselves. And that's where we don't get a whole heck of a lot done. I want to say thank you for your leadership. I want to say a congratulations on being a new dad. You know, as this as the surfing senator from Ventura, LA, uh, uh, we appreciate uh, what, what you do for us. And we appreciate you taking time out to be with us today. Right on. And uh, hey, thanks for putting this coalition together. And uh yeah, and, and putting us on YouTube. I feel, uh, you know, getting to be a little part of the, the star power here. i honored to be amongst uh, my, my brother out to the east as well, Mr. Garcia. So happy to be a part of this event here today. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, no time like the present. So uh, it's on us. Let's go get it done. Well, good after it. Thank you again, Senator Stern. All right. Be good. Well, welcome, Assemblyman Garcia. Thanks for being with us at What Matters Water TV and Podcast. Thank you for the invite. It's uh, our pleasure to uh, hang out with you all for uh, for just, uh, you know, as long as you want me here, I'll be here. <laughs> well, we won't keep you forever, but uh, Assemblyman, I, you know, I was, I was, we're doing our deep research here, you know, What Matters, and, and uh, we wanted to, I, I'm struck 
uh, in our relationship and going back and forth, I mean, you are a lifelong resident. Uh, you refer to yourself as the, the son, and the S-O-N, not the S-U-N of Coachella Valley. Um, I, I have to begin because, you know, you're very unique in being born, raised, school, everything is from the Coachella Valley. Uh, what does that community identity mean to you? And, and how has that shaped your approach to leadership in the state legislature? Good question. You know, uh, I'll give you some uh, background in terms of the community uh, that I was born and raised in is a 98% Latino of Mexican origin, uh, you know, population, very young uh, population, to say the least, 25 uh, years of age is the median age of, of the citizens there in the community. Uh, we're about 90 miles, uh, you know, pro within proximity of the international Mexican border with uh, the capital of Baja California, which is Mexicali, which is where, where my parents are from. And to have been born and raised there is, is something that I can tell you uh, early on, you know, speaking uh, Spanish was important, um, identi identifying with, you know, our, our cultural, um, you know, aspects of, of who we were uh, was important. And uh, recognizing, you know, who um, uh, lives and works in the city, uh, predominantly a uh, farm working uh, service industry, you know, community that uh, referred to as kind of a bedroom community, right, for many, many years that slowly has shifted. Uh, I went to the public schools there. Uh, admittedly, uh, I'll say I, I wasn't um, the uh, A student uh, or the B student. I was uh, the C average student uh, that uh, strived really hard to make sure that I was eligible uh, to play sports in high school. And of course you need a 2.0. And if I got there, you know, that was, uh, that was reasons to celebrate. Uh, I'm the oldest of two. Uh, as I mentioned, my parents uh, are from Mexicali. Uh, they migrated uh, to the Coachella Valley after going up and down the state of California, working in the farm uh, fields of, um, you know, the Monterey County area. Uh, in fact, my, I was driving down um, last year uh, to the district after the long session, got on the phone with my mom and I'm driving through Selena's Watsonville. And she says, you know, we used to work in those fields and, uh, in, in the city or the community of Gonzalez is where I first uh, had a date with your father. She says, that's where we first had a date. And, uh, and that, was, uh, that was the story that uh, brought me here. And so, uh, you know, for me to be raised in a community like that, that uh, has given us so much uh, and go back after graduating from college to work in the educational institutions as an adult education instructor and then run for public office uh, in the city hall where I did an internship as a as a teenager and walked out of there saying you know I'm gonna be the mayor someday and everyone kind of laughed and thought I was crazy crazy because they didn't think I could do it crazy because they said why would you want to be the mayor of this place and uh, you know now I can go to a place like Glasgow in Scotland and say I was uh, that I'm from Coachella and everyone's eyes open up really big and uh, think of the music festival at least uh, the first thing that comes to their mind. But uh, so, so that's what I was going to say. That's what a lot of people now, that's how they know Coachella is because of yeah. the music festival. But it, there's a whole lot more history and people that hey, I, I got to ask, is, is that become sort of a, a pain now that you got these thousands and thousands of people come out? Is that just like, OK, the coastal folks like, OK, we got Flatlanders coming to the beach. Now we got, you know, twice a year we get people coming out for music festivals or is that really kind of been, been embraced by the community? Look, it's been embraced by the majority of the community. Of course, it doesn't come without challenges. I will say that the um, folks who put on the event are very I said, corporate uh, uh, citizen uh, responsible individuals, mm -hmm. right? Uh, where they bring forward uh, the necessary resources to minimize and mitigate, you know, the traffic issues, the other public safety issues related to that. Uh, you know, increasing access to some of the emergency rooms during that time is critical given that you've got about 150 to 2,000 more people, 200,000 more people in the region. So they've done a good job in working with the local communities. If you ask me, it's been a great thing uh, to identify the region with uh, and introduce people from around the world that there's more beyond just a music festival known as Coachella, that there is a community that is vibrant, young, uh, culturally excited about how they identify uh, with their history and their roots and that we're be able to now turn that into economic development opportunities for people to come visit, uh, play, and uh, and invest. 
So well, let me play with that for just a little bit, but having grown then up in the community, as you said, starting work in City Hall, but then actually becoming mayor and then becoming you know, the elected representative from the area in the state legislature, what issues uh, have you really embraced, which you become you know, yeah. really passionate about? What is it that drives you now in the state legislature? Well, I'll tell you, we've been working uh, uh, heavily on uh, equity issues related to our climate change policies and making sure that we bring everyone along. You know, what does it mean uh, to pass some of the most aggressive climate uh, renewable energy policies in the world, if not in the country, and yet uh, see circumstances throughout the state where unemployment is significantly high, where people don't have access to clean water and uh, air quality is uh, exacerbating public health issues. Um, it's uh, the issues around equity in our climate uh, policies that I've really focused a lot of my time and energy and the tie in there to the work that I did at the local government level was investing into uh, hardening our infrastructure in the water uh, arena, the issue of resiliency for future growth and development. You know, the things about uh, urban greening and building parks was something that was at the cornerstone of our agenda at City Hall. And then of course, the issue of accessibility, just being a public servant that is accessible to the public and be able to take in ideas, suggestions and turn them into tangible public policy proposals to get things done. Well, it sounds like you've really embraced that issue about that physical infrastructure, that skeletal. I, I worked for a legislator seemingly 100 years ago now, and he was very fond of using the term that, you know, infrastructure was the skeletal backbone on which our communities could thrive. And you have recently been recognized by Speaker Rendon. I mean, first you were, you know, earned the role as the, the chair of the Assembly Water Parks and Wildlife. I saw with the new leadership shifts, you've now been you know, tap to move over to utilities and energy issues. Um, what's that like working with Speaker Rendon and, and what similarities do you see in that infrastructure piece of between sure. water and energy? Well, I'll tell you, they're, they're, they intersect uh, at a place in which I can give you a very uh, pragmatic example. In my district, uh, water uh, generates power. Uh, Imperial Irrigation District, one of the oldest public uh, utilities that was set up right, uh, many, many, many moons ago, uh, really uh, has and embodies that intersection of those two policy uh, arenas, the water and the power. I've uh, been on both of those committees since I arrived in the state legislature and have uh, been given the opportunity to really work on some big picture, uh, but uh, impact at the local level type issues mm -hmm. that, again, are relevant to the district that I represent. Uh, working with uh, Speaker Rendon has been uh, just a phenomenal opportunity to learn from someone who actually chaired uh, the Water Parks and Wildlife Committee at one time. And, uh, you know, one thing I can say about him is uh, I depreciate his demeanor, his uh, style of leadership that is uh, calm, uh, composed, and at the end of the day, uh, clear in terms of the vision and direction that uh, we're going in as a caucus here in the State Assembly. But, uh, you know, I'm excited to take on this new role, given the opportunities that are presenting themselves uh, as it relates to new endeavors for California, as it relates to uh, the recovery of lithium and developing an entire ecosystem of economic development uh, for California, but that uh, starts front and center uh, in our district. Well, let me be ethereal for a second, because one of the themes that I see in both water and in the energy space as it relates, particularly climate change, is this concept of resiliency. And obviously, as a water coalition, we work very closely with the governor's office in the development of the water resiliency portfolio. What does resiliency mean to you? And how do we achieve it? Whether you're talking water, you're talking energy, but again, all kind of driving to that landmark legislation that you talked about, you know, how do we get California in position for long term benefit yeah. uh, in, in recognizing climate change? You know, hardening our infrastructure, making sure that it uh, is able to meet the tests uh, that are coming before us some unprecedented times as it relates to fires and uh, water droughts, uh, making sure that we are able to literally and figuratively weather those types of, you know, uh, storms. And uh, those are things that uh, are very hard to predict, but certainly our investments will tell how well and how resilient, you know, how strong uh, mm -hmm. we are when it comes to the backbone uh, the skeleton uh, backbone that you referred to yes. uh, a few minutes ago in terms of uh, being able to continue to provide essential services to Californians. In this case, we're talking about keeping the lights on and providing, you know, a fundamental resource that we all need, and that's uh, safe, clean drinking 
water to Californians. Right. Well, I, I asked this question to Senator Stern as well. So I'm going to ask you, you know, you, you've got as the legislator, you know, you get to put those policies in place, you know, SB 100 and you, you kind of set the table and then you've got then the implementation that it takes to actually achieve. And in lots of these goals, you know, you were talking 10, 15, 20 year goals. Do you get frustrated at the pace of change? And do you see a particular role as a legislator that, you know, once you've made these bold you know, policy pronouncements, uh, whether it's in, you know, water and, and here we're talking about having to build stuff, right? Whether it's, you know, storage, conveyance, in you know, electricity, you see you've got transmission facilities, you get generation, you know, how and how do you make the system work different than how it worked historically? Does that ever frustrate you? And, and you know, do you see yourself having a role in that implementation piece to make sure we achieve the goal? Most definitely. I think legislators, uh, have a fundamental uh, you know, role to play when it comes to, uh, once we set these ambitious um, objectives, 100% uh, renewable energy by a certain period of time, you know, 5 million you know, vehicles that are electric uh, vehicles, we have to then be thorough and analytical with the intentional policy of implementation. I was having a conversation earlier about how long it takes to build transmission in our state. Right. And it's far longer than what uh, we've set as goals <laughs> to achieve 100% renewable energy. And so we've got to come back and revisit and huddle with our agencies like Cal ISO and PUC and CC and come to an understanding that if we're truly going to try to meet those objectives, that we've got to do a better job and be more efficient uh, with our processes as it relates to the implementation of this. And so, you know, I, I, we do get frustrated. The same thing with water as it relates to the issue of storage and conveyance, how long that takes and the analysis that uh, rightfully so needs to take place. But uh, the question uh, really remains is, does it need to take that long in order to right. come up with a conclusion to be able to execute projects to store water uh, or for that matter to move water? You know, I, I look at the issue of our water problems in California, not just as a storage problem, but as a conveyance problem, you know, a plumbing right. issue. We've got to move it to certain <laughs> places where the population is, and, and we've got to have those real conversations. And so um, it, it is frustrating, but look, I try to stay focused on what's at my reach, what's at our hands, and be able to chip away. We're here for uh, as long as, you know, 12 years, if the voters give us permission to, to do that. I hope that we can look in the rearview mirror uh, when we're all done and be able to point to some real tangible things that we're, we were able to accomplish in, in collaboration with our colleagues. Well, it sounds like you use what our founder back in 1984, she, you know, the, our annual award we give people is a two by four. <laughs> it's, it's like sometimes, sometimes, you know, you can set those goals, but sometimes you just need a little tap. It's like, come yeah, on, yeah. let's keep going people. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, I, I gave an example earlier in one of my conversations is that, you know, my dad, uh, God rest in peace, uh, uh, used to walk around and, and say, hey, we got to cut the cut the grass. And after the second or third time, it wasn't, hey, we got to cut the grass. It was a kick in the butt. <laughs> it's, it was it's... an unexpected kick in the butt that you better believe uh, as soon as that kick in the butt, you know, pain went away. I was grabbing, you know, the uh, lawnmower and doing what I needed to do. And yeah. sometimes we all need that kick in the butt to get on track, to get things done. Just keep focused. Well, I know that speaking of urgency, I mean, this is one of those things that's probably self-evident. You have been working around the Salton Sea for a long time, talking about slow, painful process. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, Better. yeah, this is a big, hairy, you know, complicated, multifaceted, you know, from a legislative direction and aspiration. Um, how do you see things like the Salton Sea and your progress in the Salton Sea? Again, I, I ask these questions. How does that inform kind of everything else we're doing? Yeah. Is there really hope? for getting something as complicated as a salt and sea, you know, significant, I would say resolved. I don't think we ever resolve it, but it's significant progress forward for the better. Getting our hounds around it and right. being able to at least, uh, you know, manage it, I think is what we uh, would hope we could do with any of these big challenges that are in front of us. I'll tell you that I'm very proud to, to say that today there is a $200 million construction project underway on the southwest uh, part of the Salton Sea, that is really the backbone infrastructure to additional uh, projects that will be built in the coming years. We've been able collectively with my colleague in the Senate and working with two great administrations, the present Newsom administration, 
under the leadership of Gavin Newsom and he uh, and uh, Wade Crowfoot, the Secretary of Natural Resources, have been you know, hands-on on this issue from day one. Um, there are a couple hundred million dollars uh, in a pot to implement the 10-year management salt and sea project. We're very close to breaking ground another close to 1,500, 1,600 acres in addition to the 4,000 acres that are under construction right now that have dried up because of the shrinkage of the sea and the impacts of air quality and public health are a major concern, which is why we're moving on those projects. But they've taken forever to get off the ground. <laughs> I, I was a kid when Sonny Bono was talking about uh, fixing the Salton Sea, uh, him being in Congress. And I remember yeah. him and Newt Ginrich visiting the area and, and nothing coming to flourishing. I remember his um, his uh, predecessor is his wife uh, uh, moving moving on and taking on the role and uh, talking about it and no action. And and today we're kind of, you know, kicking in the butt a little bit. You know, our representatives at the federal government uh, level as well, who own the majority of the Salton Sea and that we need to see some action on the state side. Um, you know, today we are talking about economic development opportunities in that region that intersect with the mitigation of the environmental problems and public health issues that are happening out there that lend a glimpse of hope and uh, light at the end of the tunnel uh, for the areas. We established a local body uh, that would work with the state agencies to come up with a tangible plan that would bring investment to the region uh, that's already in place by the generation of geothermal energy and uh, an addition of technology to be able to recover lithium. But the most important thing about that is how do the benefits of that go directly to mitigating and minimizing some of these salt and sea issues that uh, have been pertinent right. for decades. I'm just excited to tell you that uh, today uh, there are projects under construction. There are two or three others that are on the books getting close to getting uh, uh, you know, shovel ready and uh, showing the people of that area who deserve uh, this investment and to see uh, those environmental circumstances taken care of uh, finally coming to fruition. Well, I mean, and that's a that's a great setup. Again, you know, we're in an environment that I never thought I'd see in California, where we have had actually unprecedented revenues available to address reasonable. I mean, in the middle of some crises, right, with fires and all the other things you guys get to worry about. And it, it's it's one thing where we sort of address, you know, the five billion for water resiliency funding over the last three years or over the next three years. But it strikes me that we tend to still focus on those things that are drought mitigation. We're just yeah. mitigating the current crisis. And as you say, how do we get to that real investment for the next dry cycle, the next, you know, because as you say, like transmission and energy, it takes 10, 15, 20 years to actually build the systems, yeah. to build the facilities. Are you hopeful at all in this session or with the additional funds as another year here between the feds and the state? Are we able to make real serious investment in that long term plan or are we still just kind of addressing crises of the moment? I think we have a unique opportunity to get to the core of some of these issues. Uh, I'll give you an example that's away from the water, right, with the money that uh, we've seen with the surplus and federal government dollars coming in. We're going to put a major dent on the broadband connectivity issues uh, in the state of California. Uh, that's because we've said that is a top priority. Uh, I think that we have to set ourselves uh, to be at a place where we say addressing our water system, our antiquated water uh, system in California is a top priority. I've got a colleague, a Republican from the Central Valley, who has asked us to team up with him again to put forward a concept that would put 2% of general fund dollars every mm -hmm. single year uh, to addressing water infrastructure issues. Conceptually, I don't think that's a bad idea. Uh, I think that if we could do it in a way in which we uh, allow the legislature to still have some oversight for purposes of accountability of agencies and those stakeholders who will be carrying out the work, uh, I think that's something for us to seriously consider. Uh, but we haven't done that, it seems like. you know, We've been just chipping away at crises after crisis, the clean water crisis that uh, we were able to put forward some resources for the next 10 years to address and right. uh, parts of the state, including mine, that you have people living in mobile home parks uh, that don't have safe clean drinking water. And so, you know, again, we're yeah. chipping away at these crises, but with this unprecedented amount of money coming from the feds and from the state, uh, if we uh, really sit down, coordinate and collaborate, there could be a great opportunity to really have an impact on some of these major, major issues. 
Well, one of the other advantages of coming from as a legislator from a place like the state of California, where we're that nation state, right? We truly are recognized around the world. You, you referenced it when we opened. You just got back from Glasgow, Scotland. The ability to attend a UN, you know, climate change conference as a California representative, uh, you're viewed differently than if you were coming in from even some other nations. Um, it, it, were there any real aha moments or lessons that you pulled out of that UN conference that you, whether it's in the water or the energy space that you bring home that will inform your legislative agenda? So we, we met with folks uh, from around the world, uh, as well as from people uh, in the States who are looking at California as the go-to subnational, right? To be able to implement some of the most ambitious and aggressive climate change and renewable energy policies that the world's ever seen. One of the things that we took away though, is that uh, we're no longer um, seen by everyone as the leader. Why? Because we went first and others have now come behind us and doing things based on what they've learned California has done well and perhaps hasn't worked that well. And so one of the things that we come back with is saying, hey, we, we're no longer the, the leader of, of the pack here when it comes to these issues. We were in a room with folks from the state of Washington who were pounding their chest saying, hey, we just adopted you know, a program that is bigger, better, stronger, faster, better looking, right, than uh, California's. And we're saying, hey, You've had the benefit of looking at California's program for almost a decade now. If you couldn't do all that better, you know, shame on you. Uh, but now we get to look at them and say, what's working that they are doing different? Um, you know, some of the things that uh, we talked about are the issue of uh, infrastructure transmission in the power uh, sector in terms of being able to, to move faster to meet these ambitious goals. And it's clear that, that we're just not there. And when it comes to the urgency of the water crisis in California with this drought, everyone wants to say, well, why haven't we built the storage that was planned out mm -hmm. by Prop 1A? And I was glad to see the Water Commission move uh, Sites Reservoir just a little bit further. I know we brought okay. some attention to uh, that project in the legislature, thanks to the leadership of Senator Hurtado and uh, Assembly Member Arambula in the last couple of years, bringing proposals forward to, to bring that uh, project to front and center. And, uh, but look, uh, it is frustrating to go back to your other question, uh, <laughs> to go to Glasgow and and uh, and no longer be the, as they would say, the top dogs when it comes to uh, the climate uh, conversation around the world. But, you know, we've set our goals um, uh, in a way in which they're so ambitious that uh, we have to remind ourselves that there's work to be done. It isn't just about setting the goal and putting it on <laughs> autopilot. There's a lot of legislation and uh, details that need to be uh, hashed out in between all that. So, I mean, I can talk to you all day about all the different intricacies of the water system and how it all works between storage and conveyance and storm water and recycling. And, and, and you're right, it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle that we just try to put the pieces together to make the system as a whole work. And we're trying to make it work, you know, 50 years from now, not for, you know, the last 50 years. But because of that, again, I sort of go back to California really is, you know, the advantage of California, we're really big and we're really diverse. Problems, California is really big, and we're really diverse. Yeah. How do you, when you get to these things like Delta conveyance, I mean, salt and sea, I mean, you've worked hands-on, really controversial to some people because you're really affecting lives on both ends. How do you just personally, how do you bring people together? Advice that for people like a coalition like ours, where we're trying to bring people to the table, get everybody's voice heard, how do you like to bring people into those conversations? Yeah. Well, the first thing is to try to be, uh, you know, as transparent as you possibly can to let people know, here's my agenda, right? Here are my, you know, priorities in this conversation. And, and hope that others come with that same approach as well uh, to be able to then really determine what are the things that we're gonna agree on? What are the things that we're just not gonna be able to agree on and focus on those things that uh, we found some common ground and begin to execute. We can come back to the things that we didn't agree on mm -hmm. to be able to figure out if there's some room, some compromise. Is there something that can be done to minimize or mitigate you know, the concerns that you're raising based on the position of starting at no or at zero, we're not going to go there. Um, I try to really uh, use our time in the legislature as productive as we possibly can to focus on the things that we can get done 
and uh, and try then to come back at some of those more challenging things uh, from a different perspective uh, to demonstrate good faith that we can actually get some things done when we agree uh, to get them done. And Assemblyman Eduardo Garcia, I, I cannot thank you enough for taking time to be with us and talk about this. Uh, one of your colleagues told me, you know, new nickname, and I think it's true based on having heard you today, is Eddie the Truth Garcia, being able to speak directly and be very honest and upfront. I, I, I cannot thank you enough for taking time to be with us, sort of setting us up and talking about it. We really look forward to working with you this next legislative session and being able to really tackle some of these you know, very vexing issues, whether it's in energy or in water, but you know, we're going to make California resilient. We just got to find the way to help get there, and we're going to come to the table and be a part of that with you. We thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for the invitation. Let's do this again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Assemblyman Garcia. Well, thanks for joining us at What Matters Water TV and Podcast. If you like today's discussion, go to wherever you download your podcasts and give us that five-star rating. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. That'll help us build our presence in this new world and in this new format. If you're interested in helping sponsor this program, we're always looking for your assistance. Please reach out to, to us at SoCalWater.org and send us a message. We'll be back in touch and we'll get you involved. And as we close today's show, I leave you with this challenge. Be a part of the conversation. Be a part of the solution. At the Southern California Water Coalition, we educate to advocate. So as public policy leaders have difficult choices to make, together we help them make informed decisions. We thank you for being with us. We'll see you again next time on What Matters Water TV and Podcast.